Every morning, let us savor an excerpt from Yong Jie Xuan Zhui's Song of Enlightenment. And then, let's meditate. This is Lama Jigme Gyatso of the Buddha Joy Meditation School. Welcome to Meditate Like a Jedi, which is brought to you by the good-hearted folks who help support this channel on Patreon. This early morning, we could chant and meditate and enjoy a lesson or two. But first, if you love Star Wars and you wish to meditate as transformatively as Yoda on Dagobah under the guidance of Qui-Gon Jinn, be sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. Good news. If at any point during this, the, <laughs> during this early morning's live stream, you have a specific question about Buddhist meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them to your life, simply type your question in great detail in the chat window on the right-hand side of the screen. Let's chant. This is a challenging one. Pradhana Shura broke the gravest precepts, but he went on to realize the unborn. The Buddhahood he attained in that moment lives with us now in our time. So there's some really interesting things to unpack. So let's talk about precepts. And to understand precepts, let's go back, tap button five, and look at a comparison chart. Yes, that comparison chart. So as we go through life, we are shaped, we, we have two default modes, patriarchy or yang, or matriarchy or yin. So let's look at patriarchy. Classical patriarchy is actually, when, one is uh, under the influence of patriarchy. One tends to be rigid, fearful, controlling, elitist, competitive, and cruel. In that structure, there is no true empathy. In the absence of that empathy, one relies on rigidity, fear, and controlling tendencies to manufacture an analog of morality. Now, the opposite of patriarchy is true matriarchy. And forgive me if this sounds like a no true Scotsman argument, but false matriarchy is simply patriarchy with different plumbing, and it's just as disastrous. But true matriarchy, according to the 81 po uh, poems of the Dante Ching, helps one to be flexible, loving, laid back, egalitarian, cooperative, and kind. So if loving describes our intentions, and kind describes our behavior. We have something very powerful here. In the, in the presence of true empathy, in the presence of compelling empathy, rules are unnecessary and actually do more harm than good. It is in this context that we learn that the highest Dzogchen teachers of Tibet agree that the greatest love is spontaneous and uncontrived. Perhaps that is why the great uh, Tibetan saint Karma Chakme Rinpoche taught that the essence of morality is simply non-violence. Perhaps that is also why 50% of the Eightfold Path pertains to loving kindness, loving wishes, kind communication, kind conduct, and kind commerce. If that is our guiding light, 
then rules are unnecessary. Now, the next intelligent question should be, how does one make that their guiding light? Now, here's a wonderful irony. Those upon the path of patriarchy, those defined by rigidity, fear, controlling tendencies, um, competitiveness, uh, cruelty, and elitism, rely on self-manipulation, coercion, contemplation, and the like. Those freed from such follies, those defined by being flexible, loving, laid-back, egalitarian, cooperative, and kind, don't need that. What do they do? They rely on the basic meditation of using our uh, every inhalation to access our... Well, actually, let's be more specific. So to answer that in even greater detail, I'm going to tap button 9 and bring us over to the practice text, which we'll explore in greater detail in a few minutes. So when it comes to the essential practice, it's actually very simple. Physically, we emulate the, 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 the posture described in this statue. It's comfortable and it's sustainable. Respirationally, I've got to find a better adjective. We, our inhalation is shorter and sharper and our exhalation is longer and softer. Now, this is the exciting part. Mentally, during the inhalation, we silently and mentally recite the monosyllabic demonstrative pronoun, this. Why do we do that? Every inhalation is already wired by natural selection to give us automatic access to our sympathetic nervous system which has evolved not for active concentration, but instead for to notice things vulnerably, passively, viscerally, and randomly. We evolve to perceive sights, sound, sensations, flavors, scents, and the like, including emotion, intention, thought, memory, and imagination. We evolved to perceive spontaneously, passively, viscerally, and randomly the external, the internal, the physical, the mental, the pleasurable, the painful, the interesting, the boring, the glorious, and the grotesque. What do we do with that which we notice? During our exhalation, we could silently and mentally recite the three-syllable verb, relaxing. For natural selection has wired our every exhalation to our parasympathetic nervous system, which has evolved for both physical relaxation, as well as mental release. Now, let's pay a trip to button number seven and revisit the central nervous system. When we are in peril, our electrical activity coalesces at the bottom of our brain in an area described as the amygdala, our fear center. From this fear center, we can behave in a cruel, elitist, rigid, clearly fearful manner. However, when we have worked therapeutically with our autonomic nervous system in meditation, this, this elect electrical activity returns to its default setting, which is over here in our anterior cingulate gyrus, 
that which is described sometimes poetically as the hub of our mirror neurons, the seat of empathy. This is, is our birthright, this empathy. And we are, our birthright is returned to us from a healthy practice of meditation, of true meditation, that is autonomic nervous system oriented. Now, having gone through that rigmarole, let's return to the opening passage. When we are meditating effectively and regularly, at least approximately once every 12 hours, we're going to find ourselves living from empathy, the, which is the highest morality. This same effective and regular meditation that restores our empathy helps us to live from a place not of scatteredness, nor of contrivance. It helps us live from a place of centered spontaneity. When our empathy, when our choices and our utterances and our deeds are flowing in the momentum of empathetic, centered spontaneity, there is no need for precepts. In fact, precepts are like a sea anchor slowing us down. However, we do not always, for whatever reason, we do not always have access or the opportunity to meditate as often as we would like to. We do not often have the opportunity to receive the instructions we need to learn how to meditate. And because of various uh, circumstantial or medical phenomena, one can find oneself in a position where they have a psychotic break and where they do horrible things. In that situation, there are some people in patriarchy. There are some people who are dominated by the tendency of being Rigid, fearful, controlling, competitive, cruel, and elitist. They will tell you, A, there is no way to redeem yourself. For this rest of this life and all your future lives, you're cursed. Thank you very much. Or they'll work out this ridiculous thing where you have to collect hundreds and thousands of bows and offerings and stuff like that which is a wonderful way to subjugate other people. Remember, patriarchy is all about subjugation. I have acquaintances in every sect of Buddhism, having studied every sect of Buddhism, and um, I've known, I've uh, spent time with Theravada monks who tell me of the sectarianism within the Theravada community. And many, 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 many centuries ago, um, one group or subgroup of Theravada monks felt that another group of Theravada monks had broken all their precepts. And for the precepts to be restored, they had to be subjugated. And for many centuries ago into the present, that group wears their robes differently than the other members to set them apart as that previously fallen group. Now that is a wonderful uh, uh, example of elitism and control and it's vulgar and ugly and disturbing and it doesn't come from love, it doesn't come from flexibility, it doesn't come from egalitarianism. So whether we're dealing with individuals or groups over real violations of, pre of precepts or imagined or fabricated violations of precepts, there is a lot of ugliness. Now, how's about some good news?
when we practice the Buddha's, when we perform the Buddha's essential practice, and what I just described a few minutes ago, correlating inhalation and exhalation with mindfulness and meditation in a way that to which we have evolved neurologically and that works profoundly well, that, according to the author, is the ultimate purification. Uh, to put it in terms of Mahayana teachings, mastery of shunyata, mastery of emptiness, is the ultimate purification. So all mastery means is that we get so good at a technique that we practice it spontaneously, habitually, easily, and effectively. According to the Buddha, you can attain mastery of anything in a week. It doesn't require three great lifetimes. It doesn't require a, a decade. It doesn't require you getting a PhD. You can master the path in a week. That is cool. So according to the author of this highly lauded Shastra, Jung, Jiaxuan, Jue, and please forgive my pronunciation, I'm not a polyglot. The, the mastery of this essential practice is the, not only the ultimate uh, purification, but the key to enlightenment itself. The Buddhahood he attained in that moment lives with us now in our time. So in other words, despite his mistakes, and we've all made every kind of mistake, or at least every category of mistake. It's like that song that came out in 1971 or 1972 by the main ingredient, Everybody Plays the Fool. Oh, hell yes. I know I have. Maybe you, too. Let me know in the comment area. Um, but the, pra the fundamental practice of blending mindfulness and meditation with our inhalation and our exhalation is the key to the wisdom and the love that is the path. It is the key to mastering the entire eightfold path, the path of uh, right view, right intention, right communication, right conduct, right uh, commerce, Enthusiasm, mindfulness, and meditation is all contained within that one technique. Having explored that, what having explored that passage, let's turn our attention now to this morning's to the latest iteration of our daily practice text, or sadhana, if you're fancy. I've titled it Easy Meditations Proto Zen because that uh, Shastra we're reading from predates uh, the formation of the two primary Zen schools of China and Japan. It doesn't predate meditation, but it predates that sect. Go to a restaurant, and typically, before you receive the main course, you'll receive an hors d'oeuvre, and after your main course, a dessert. Our main course is meditation. Our dessert is going to be the chant of the four measurables, and our hors d'oeuvre is going to be the chant of bodhicitta and refuge that we used to stimulate the neural pathways of empathy and enthusiasm. Let's play with this right now. May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. 
May I liberate all beings from the tyranny of hating, craving, and clinging by relying on the Buddha's example, instructions, and students. Quick review. Mindfulness and meditation are known by many names, such as Zen, Shan, Jhana, Mahamudra, Ati Yoga, Dzogchen, Tre- and Treksho, which is also known as Slice Through. Okay, guys, let's buckle up. Let's meditate and remember if at any point during this morning's live stream, any point at all, you have a specific question about either Buddhist meditation or Buddhist philosophy or how to apply them to your life, simply type your question in great detail in the chat window on the right hand side of the screen. Remember, your questions on those subjects do not bother me. I live to answer those questions. Let's talk about the breathing ratio. Here we're talking about a short inhalation symbolized by one syllable and a longer exhalation represented by three syllables. Now, with my disabilities, including uh, ADHD and autism, uh, due to a dysregulated, dysregulated function of dopamine, if if I practiced three syllables on the in-breath as well as three syllables on the out-breath, I would get drowsy and fall asleep, which is why if I meditate right before bed or if I meditate in bed lying down while falling asleep, I'll meditate in a 3-3 breathing ratio. And when I am sitting upright during the day and I want to meditate without falling asleep, I breathe in a 1-3 to three breathing ratio. Now, I'm giving you a hall pass. If you have some sort of a different, if you are, if you have some sort of uh, physical challenge or neurological challenge that makes you different, you might need to play with these ratios differently. So don't be afraid to experiment. And Think of Picasso. Before he got all creative and abstract, he learned how to paint typically. He learned the rules before breaking the rules. So when you learn these techniques and these rules of thumb I'm giving you, they're not designed to be a prison uh, cell, but a lifeline, like the tether used by an astronaut during a spacewalk to prevent him from just flying off into the expanse. So... If you feel you need to experiment, then experiment. And when you get less than ideal results, because any ask any scientist, they'll tell you more often than not, experimentation is, un, is, un, is, is receiving the results you were not hoping for. You always have a lifeline to return to. And that lifeline is the one to three breathing ratio. So as someone with uh, the propensity, with, with ADHD and autism, the specter of the dreaded meltdown or psychotic break has been ever present in my life. And so that's one of the things that induced me to use the spiritual path as a sort of practical magic to tame the... Uh, rampant wildebeest within so that I um, I'm not a danger to myself and others. I've said all that to say this. When I feel the hot breath of a meltdown, 
or a psychotic break on my neck, when it feels uh, eminent, I will deliberately use a 3-3 breathing ratio to help me, for want of a better term, power down. Um, sometimes that can be very, very helpful. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need uh, great alertness. Uh, it depends on the body and the brain and the circumstances. I've said all that to say this. These tools are like the colors, the pigments found upon an artist's palette. We mix them and match them as needed. We do not traverse the path of patriarchy, the path of indulging our controlling tendencies. We do not meditate to say, I want to feel this or I don't want to feel that. We meditate so that we can notice with the utmost of vulnerability and release with the utmost of efficiency. Notice, release, this is the way. The path of Yun is the path of acquiescence. And there are many people who think they're much more clever than they really are. And they will say, I'm so loving, I want to feed and house all the poor. And to do that, I need money. So, how can I meditate in such a way to manifest great wealth so that I can do great good? I was one of those idiots. <laughs> And I'm cursed to see, to, I'm, I am frequently pelted, metaphorically, by other idiots with the same thing. And the answer is, master the path and everything will take care of itself. Postpone the path in the name of accomplishing a fraction of the path. And you'll shoot yourself in the foot, like I did for oh so many years. I would not recommend that. As we, as we master the path, not only does uh, aspirational love take care of itself, but because of the marriage of empathy and centered spontaneity, our utterances, our choices, utterances, and deeds are naturally loving. And it's been the observation of people far wiser than myself that living that way with spontaneous love and walking in centered spontaneity creates a domino-like, a falling domino-like effect of benefit, far-reaching and far-benefiting the world around us. Raised as we are in patriarchal societies, we're, we're always chasing after one goal. And by the way, that chase is typified beautifully and humorously and sadly by a song uh, by the group, group Cake uh, titled Going the Distance. You can find the video on YouTube. Look it up. It's amazing. Um, but it shows the folly of a yang existence. But anyway, we are brainwashed by that. We are programmed by our culture to think we must actively strive uh, as opposed to borrow the lyrics from the 1970s musical The Wiz and ease on down the road. So... 
we can sprint down the road or ease down the road, the Buddha would recommend the second. Please be aware, be wary, wary, wary. Yes, please be wary of uh, pseudo spiritual Darwinism that says if patriarchy outshouts matriarchy, then it must be superior. And if the political wranglings of patriarchy, um, undermine uh, the passive gentle path of matriarchy, then patriarchy must be superior. That reminds me of the phrase, you probably heard this before, history, the histories are written by the victors. I've traversed the path of patriarchy, I've traversed the path of matriarchy, and I gotta tell you, patriarchy will take you many places but enlightenment is not one of them. Peace is not one of them. Freedom is not one of them. Those things are only provided by matriarchy, yin, the path of being flexible, loving, laid back, egalitarian, cooperative, and kind. I remember one time I was in a public situation and this big guy, you know, he was taller than me and heavier than me and he wanted to fight. And so I back, I assumed a combat stance and he screamed at me to drop my guard, which seemed to me a stupid piece of advice to apply. Similarly, I've had members, ordained members of patriarchy demand that I stop being um, 
active in progressive politics. And um, it's the same thing. I'm not just as a combatant is unwise to drop their guard. Those who are traversing the path of both love, spontaneous and contrived, as well as behavior that is centered and, and spontaneous, for them to not sign petitions, to not be a voice of wisdom and love, is an impossibility. Two types of people. One person, when they've climbed the ladder, pull the ladder up so that no one else can attain what they've attained. Other people, when they've climbed the ladder, they reach down and pull the next person up, paying it forward, so to speak. Empathy is the engine that drives sustainability. If uh, uh, Homo sapiens sapien is to persist upon this planet, we empathy and wisdom must be paramount in our hearts and our minds and our cultures and our laws.
Let us seal our practice with a bit of the old wishing love. May everyone be free from misery, may everyone be happy. May no one be separated from the happiness. May everyone have balance from the tyranny of hate and craving and clinging freed. If you feel that I have earned it, you could type something in the chat window. You could give this live stream a thumbs up. You could share it with a friend. You could even help support this channel on Patreon. In approx oopsie, wrong button. In approximately two and two thirds hours, I would very much like to return to lead today's mid-morning meditation. Until then, may you and yours be happy and healthy. And if you are as geeky as me, this is the way. <laughs>